Welcome back to Movie Recaps. Today I will show you a horror film from 2019, entitled Countdown. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. A few young people can be seen sitting around a table at a house party. The girls talk about counting calories, so one of them shows an app on her phone for keeping track of your food intake. The other one wants to download it, but searching for that app she finds another one called Simply Countdown. The others asks about it and she reads the description which states that it can tell you exactly when you're going to die. All of them, except Courtney, want to make a drinking game out of it, with the one with the least to live will drink everything that's on the table. Courtney reluctantly does it too and accepts the terms and conditions. They go around the table and everyone gets 60 to 30 years of life. Courtney looks upset as she shows them that she only has 3 hours to live. The rest make fun of her and tell her that she has to abide by the rules of the game and drink, when her boyfriend Evan comes over and drinks instead of her. Later, the two of them are going over to his car. He's visibly drunk. When they enter, she asks him to walk her to her house and not drive home, but he doesn't want to. She gets out and starts walking, while he tries to convince her to come back in and when he doesn't succeed, he dives off angrily. Courtney gets a message from the app, saying she's broken the user agreement. As she continues walking it looks like somebody is following her. The app says she has less than two minutes to live, prompting her to run into her house, as the app continues to blare on her phone. She powers it off. Courtney walks into the bathroom and becomes increasingly paranoid, so she checks the shower curtain. Then she goes to drink some water, but hears the curtains move again. She turns around, but something grabs her from above and drops her on the shower, breaking her head. She dies when the countdown timer runs down to zero. Meanwhile, Evan was in a car accident and the passenger seat where Courtney was supposed to be is completely trashed. Quinn can be seen exiting an elevator, rolling a nurse's cart through a hospital. She walks into a room, discovering that one of the patients hasn't finished his lunch. She knows where to find him. He's sitting on a balcony in a closed wing of the hospital. It's Evan. She sits with him and tries to make small talk to relax him for surgery, but he shows her the countdown app, which says that he has only around 19 hours left. He tells her about the app and his girlfriend, convinced that it knew when she was going to die. Evan thinks that the app also knows that he will die during his surgery. Quinn tells him not to worry about the app and makes him come back to his room. They meet Amy on the way and she tells Quinn to come with her. The hospital staff surprises her with a cake because she passed the nurse's test. As they're sitting and eating cake, Quinn jokes about the app and some of the others have already heard about it. They laugh about it when Scott gets more than 50 years to live and so does Dr. Sullivan. Suddenly, a man walks in carrying a woman that's overdosing. The doctor checks her right there on the floor and Amy tells Quinn to bring the kit with the drugs to counteract what she's taken. Amy administers it to the woman and she wakes up. Later, Quinn is leaving work, when she gets an ad for the app. She downloads it and enters her information, agreeing to the terms. The app tells her that she has little over two days to live. Suddenly Dr. Sullivan walks into the elevator and flirts with her, but she tries to let him off easy. That night, Quinn is at home finishing her nursing documents, when she runs into a problem. She calls Scott to ask for help and he tells her that she'll need to enter the information from her birth certificate. Quinn doesn't have it with her, but she knows where to find it. She goes to get it from her parents' house. Once there, she sifts through her mom's papers and finds it on the bottom of the pile. Something moves in the closet behind her and when she opens it, she finds her sister Jordan there, along with her boyfriend. He puts his clothes on and leaves, but Quinn scolds her sister about it. Jordan is angry with her for parenting her and not coming over to see her more often after their mom died. Quinn goes to her room to apologize and tell her about finishing her studies, when her father wakes and comes to greet her. He's happy to see Quinn and asks her if she wants to come with them to visit her mom's grave one day. The next day, Evan is preparing for his surgery and sees that he has around three minutes to live. He leaves the room and the app pushes a notification on his phone telling him he's broken the agreement. Evan sees a deathly figure behind him in the mirror, but no one's there in real life. He escapes to the stairwell, but it follows. The app continues to notify him of the countdown. Evan can't get out of the dark stairwell, when he hears footsteps inside the stairwell. He uses the light on his phone, but can't see anyone downstairs. Evan looks up and thinks he sees Courtney, but it's something else and it's coming after him. His phone drops down the stairs and when the countdown reaches zero, he falls down too. A little later, Quinn comes to work and Amy informs her about Evan. She remembers the app and seems disturbed. Then Quinn goes to his room and when she sees her colleague packing it up, she tells her that she'll take over. She finds his phone and realizing she needs his fingerprint to open it, goes to see his body in the basement facility. Quinn tries to open his phone with his thumb, but because it doesn't work she tries again with his face. 
She opens his eyes and manages to open the phone finally, only to see the countdown has reached zero. Suddenly, his hand falls and touches her, so she drops the phone. When she picks it up, his head is turned and he's looking at her. She puts the body back inside the freezer. Quinn checks her phone to see that she has less than two days to live and the countdown time is at the same hour when she'll meet her father and sister at her mother's grave. She calls her dad and cancels their plan. The app sends her a notification that she's broken the user agreement, when there's a figure in the room she passes. She comes back and no one's there. Suddenly, Dr. Sullivan scares her. He asks her to help with a patient, but she has trouble with a machine. She wants to leave and he stops her trying to awkwardly comfort her. The doctor makes another advance on her and she declines, but he keeps going. When she pushes him off, he pseudo-apologizes, so she goes to find nurse Amy and tell her about what's happened. Before she can say anything, the doctor calls for Amy and she doesn't get to tell her. The app flashes another notification. That night, Quinn tries to delete the app, but can't so she searches for it online and finds information about Courtney. She watches a video from a girl ranting about the app, saying that she's seeing things, like her dead cousin. Suddenly, the girl says her time is up, then she sees something, screams and drops her phone. The comments under the video say it's a fake, so Quinn relaxes a little bit and shuts her laptop, when suddenly she sees dead Evan. Her phone pushes another notification, so she breaks it, but it still shows the countdown. Quinn gets in her car and falls asleep there. Jordan wakes her up in the morning. The two of them go up to her apartment and her sister finds her smashed up phone, seeing the app and telling her she only has one more day to live. She jokes with her when she figures out the app and then asks to stay with her, because their dad went on a last-minute work trip. When Quinn refuses, Jordan storms out. The app beeps again and she scratches her finger on the broken screen. Later, she's in a shop, buying a new phone. Quinn opens it even before the guy can run her card. She gets a completely new phone and SIM card, so she checks if the app is there. When she doesn't see it, she goes to leave, but another notification arrives and the app is on the new phone as well. She asks the guy about the app and he tries to delete it, but can't. When she finally leaves, one of the other customers asks the store guy about the app. Quinn is in her car, checking the app which has continued to count down, then suddenly sees a deathly figure in her back camera. It can only be seen there. Suddenly, it grabs her from the back seat and she rams into another car, falling out of her own. The guy from the other car screams at her, while the customer from the store walks out and tells him to stop. He scares him away, then shows her he also has the app. Later, they're seen in a bar, talking about it. She says they should find a way to see the user agreement for the app again and Matt tells the crazy guy in the bar to download it. They go over to him and when he reaches the terms and conditions page, Quinn starts reading them. It says that they have to accept their fate. The crazy guy still agrees to the terms and the app tells him that he'll live to 91. Quinn and Matt go to the hospital and speak to the priest. They ask him what he knows about demons, but he says that he doesn't believe in them and sends them to someone else. Before they leave, Amy asks to talk to Quinn. Matt goes to the restroom. Someone wants to get inside his stall and he sees a barefoot child under the door. As he's washing his hands, he hears someone crying in one of the stalls and when he goes to check, he sees the barefoot kid again, walking through the stalls like there's nothing in between. It stops at the last stall. The lights go out and Matt goes to check the stall. There is nothing in there, but something appears behind him and calls his name. It attacks him and when the lights come back on, it isn't there anymore. Meanwhile, Amy takes Quinn to a meeting with HR and Dr. Sullivan. He says that she was the one to corner him and not the other way around. The man from HR says that she'll get suspended, when Quinn starts explaining her side of the story. Amy confronts her, but Quinn storms out. Matt is waiting for her and he doesn't tell her what's happened. He keeps hearing the voice of the thing that attacked him. They walk into a church looking for the man the other priest told them about. They find him in his office. He's super excited that they ask him about demons and immediately thinks of an ancient story. In it, a prince gets a scroll from an old gypsy woman, foretelling the exact hour in which he would die. She heeds him a warning that he mustn't use the information to alter his fate. But the prince still does and goes back to the gypsy, telling her that death is after him. She tells him that it's not death, but a demon that will torture him until the moment he dies as the scroll foretold. He tells them to find someone to hack the app for them. They go to the store guy, Derek for help and bribe him to help them. He knows the app and makes fun of them for believing it, but he still hacks it for them. The code for the app is in Latin. They also find the countdowns for all the people using the app inside the code, including Derek's. He changes all the parameters for his countdown, then looks for Quinn when they find her sister's countdown too. 
Her clock is almost the same as hers, though Derek changes it. Jordan sees the change on her phone, but the woman who's watching her, takes her phone. Matt and Quinn thank Derek for changing their countdowns as he's driving away. Then Quinn asks Matt to stay with her that night. They are getting ready for bed and even leave the lights on because they're still sacred. Matt tells her a story about his dead brother and she tells him about her mom. They were both bad to them before they died. The two of them are sleeping in the bed, when the lights go out. Quinn hears something in front of the room and tries to wake Matt up, but the demon is the one in bed with her. When the real Matt takes off her covers, the demon disappears. The app still goes back to their original countdown. Quinn remembers her sister's countdown. Meanwhile, Jordan hears her phone ring in the old woman's room and goes to get it. She sees that her countdown has changed, when something appears in front of her room. Jordan goes to check it out and the lights go out again. She goes back into her room and closes the door, but when she turns around the door is open. Then, she hides under her bed and hears her mom calling to her, asking for her sister. Something pushes her bed aside and suddenly, her dead mother appears. Jordan runs to the front door and Quinn and Matt are there. They go to see the demon priest again. He reads the code in Latin for them. It's a curse that he can find a way to break and lift from them. He thinks that if they can keep one of them alive longer than what the app says, the curse will be broken. His plan is to hide in a blessed circle of salt long enough to keep one of them alive, so that they can lift the curse. Quinn mixes the salt with paint and as they are laying it on the ground, the priest blesses the salt. The circle is painted on the floor, when they check Mott's countdown timer. He steps aside, panicking, but Quinn kisses him. The lights go out and all of them get inside the circle. As the demon approaches, the priest is praying. The demon appears behind them, but it can't get inside the circle. The priest tries to vanquish it back to hell, when the app starts blaring. Suddenly, a toy robot reaches the circle that only Matt can see. His brother appears and lures him out of the circle. The demon grabs him and drags him away. Quinn runs after him, but as she reaches Matt, a car hits him and he dies with the countdown. Jordan is hurt, so Quinn takes her to the hospital. As a doctor is taking care of her sister, one of her colleagues tells her that she knows what happened with Dr. Sullivan and that she will be with her if she goes after him. They hug, but Quinn sees the doctor talking to her sister and goes over there. She thanks him, but has some kind of plan for him. Jordan tells Quinn that their mother's death was her fault and not Quinn's, but she says it's none of their fault. The two of them reconcile and Jordan says that at least they will spend the last minutes of their lives together. Quinn doesn't think they will die, because she has a plan. She goes into Dr. Sullivan's office and apologizes to him, manipulating him. He sees right through her and asks her what she wants. She says she wants her job back and tells him to follow her into the closed wing. Moments later, the doctor walks in and looks for her around the closed wing, finding pieces of her clothing on the ground. Quinn is playing a game with him. Suddenly, she hits him with a wrench and wants to inject him with morphine, when Jordan shows up and stops her. The demon drags the doctor away. Quinn thinks that if she kills him before his countdown it will break the curse, so she goes to find him. Jordan looks for her, as her app shows her that she has less than two minutes to live. Suddenly the demon appears behind her. Meanwhile, Quinn is still looking for the doctor, when she hears something. He knocks her out and gets ready to kill her, but she comes after him again. She chases him down, but the demon pushes her away and he escapes. Quinn gets another idea. Simultaneously, Jordan is being chased by the demon. She tries to hide from it, but her app gives her position away. A freezer opens and she goes over to investigate, when the demon grabs her and throws her through a window. Her time is running out as the demon closes in to kill her, when suddenly Quinn shows up with a syringe pushed up against her skin, telling it to let her sister go. Jordan begs her not to kill herself and the demon turns into her mother, diverting her attention. Jordan's time is ticking and Quinn is distracted for a moment, but she realizes what's happening and shoots the morphine in her veins. She dies before her time and the demon can't take her. Quinn has lifted the demon's curse. Jordan cries over her sister's dead body when she sees the name of a drug written on her arm and a bottle rolling away. She injects it into Quinn's arm and it counteracts the morphine, bringing her back from the dead. Sometime later, Quinn, Jordan and their father visit their mom's gravesite. As they're about to leave, Quinn gets a notification. The beta version of the countdown app has been installed on her phone. In an after credit scene, Derek is seen on a date with a woman in a restaurant. His date is disappointed and goes to the restroom before they leave. Derek gets a notification from the app, counting his minutes down. The lights go out and a demonic sound can be heard, along with Derek's screams. Alice stares out of the window while Rebecca helps her pack for her new venture. She has to complete her screenplay, since its deadline comes near. Rebecca is doing her best to look out for her friend. 
Alice casually walks towards a drawer and pulls out a revolver. At the sight of the firearm, Rebecca becomes worried, since her friend is moving away while in possession of an illegal firearm. Alice thinks it is essential for her to have a weapon in case her ex-boyfriend, Ben, comes and attacks her a second time. While Alice is nonchalant about the situation, her moving to an isolated place worries Rebecca. She begs Alice to stay close. However, Alice has already decided that she does not want to remain in her apartment, where Ben can find her. Alice messes around with her camera while Rebecca drives to her secret workplace. The two casually flirt as the journey continues, but Rebecca is more interested in how Alice afford a remote mansion in the middle of nowhere, even without money. We find out that a producer allowed Alice to use the place when she had writer's block. It seems like she's taking advantage of said producer. The two approach the mansion and slowly see the residence's sheer size. Walking in, they are amazed by the decor. They walk together like a married couple, looking around the new home. The two lie down in the bed and begin talking about the distance this new residence will place between them. Realizing this is Ben's fault, Rebecca tries to console Alice, but she comes across as pitying her, so Alice decides to dismiss the conversation and check out the rest of the house. At this point, it's obvious that Rebecca regards Alice as somewhat closer than a friend. While Rebecca is alone in the room, the creaking of a cupboard door makes her feel uncomfortable. She then leaves the room and looks for Alice as an eerie feeling follows her. Rebecca finds Alice in a room with an infant's cot inside, a sight that brings back horrible memories. Alice tortures herself by reminiscing her unfortunate past regarding children, so Rebecca steers her away. Rebecca does not want Alice to be held up in the mansion, so she offers to leave the car behind. However, Alice insists that the car's presence will serve no purpose. Rebecca agrees to take the car, but she is still concerned for her friend's well-being. Later, Alice escorts Rebecca off outside. At this point, it's safe to say Rebecca is the more responsible one of the two, showing concern for how Alice spends her time and looking after her. Eventually, Alice is left alone in the mansion with no one to accompany her, except the camera in her hands. Alice walks around the mansion and tries to take in her surroundings, to better grasp the environment around her. She eventually ends up in her room to unpack, and finds a heartfelt letter from Rebecca on top of a suitcase. The house is silent, only the sounds of dripping water and creaking doors are all Alice hears, as she unpacks her hygiene items, and places them in the kitchen vanity. She also takes her prescription antidepressants, to alleviate the symptoms caused by her past trauma. Alice then leaves the bathroom, turning off the lights. Suddenly in pitch darkness, a spirit of sorts reveals itself in front of the vanity. During the night, Alice keeps working on her screenplay. A phone call interrupts her during her writing session, only for no one to answer on the other end. With the silence not subsiding, Alice ends the call, but hears a faint screaming. Alice prepares to fall asleep as her nightly routine comes to an end. However, she is forced to get up when she hears the distant sound of a door shutting and the struggling groans of a woman. She gets up and leaves her room to investigate the source of the noise. While it may be a burglar or some random invader, Alice is expecting her ex-boyfriend, which makes her more anxious. She walks around the house and eventually finds a chair. She then stares at it until it falls over on its own. It turns out that Alice is dreaming. She wakes up nervously sweating and struggling to catch her breath. She then leaves her bed and puts on a bathrobe, clearly still shaken from her nightmare. She becomes more aware of her surroundings until she eventually gets in her bathtub to calm herself. She is relaxing under the water, but her rest ends when she starts hearing a woman's voice again. The door of the bathroom then swings open. Alice is shaken, but calms down as she convinces herself that nothing is wrong. Alice hops on a call with Rebecca, who informs her that Ben has left prison and went to her apartment in search of her. This makes Alice even more uncomfortable, as she now feels unsafe despite being secluded far enough that no one should be able to find her. She cuts the call as her anxiety gets the better of her, and she falls asleep. She wakes up at night, hearing someone shuffle past the door of her room. She walks to her table and then walks around the house. She then goes up the stairs and finds footprints leading into a room. Finally, she goes up the stairs inside until she ends up in a dark attic. Alice starts looking around, suspecting that something strange is happening, and someone is luring her to this place. She finds a suitcase placed on top of a table. Inside she finds what she suspects to be a woman's belongings. Alice goes through all the different items inside, but her attention is caught by a tipped over box with videotapes inside. The videotapes are scattered all over the floor, so she checks them out. They are all labeled, supposedly owned by some woman called Lucy, who might also be the owner of the items in the suitcase. Alice goes outside, takes out her camera, places the videotape inside, and transfers the feed to her laptop to see the recorded footages. One of the tapes show Lucy and David Woods, a newly married couple, preparing for a visit from David's mom. Alice finds out that the house belongs to David's mother. At night, Alice looks over a recording of her and Rebecca. In the recording, it's clear that there is sexual tension between them. Alice has never been open about her relationship with Rebecca, because it may make Ben angry at her. Another night in the mansion goes by, and more sounds of a woman crying can be heard coming from across the house. This time, Alice hears the sounds from the bathtub while the faucet is running. Alice tries to keep calm and closes the tap, but she can't help but leave the room scared. Upon leaving the bathroom, she notices her laptop screen covered in strange writing. She walks over and notices a message resembling a plea for help, spanning the screen. Alice tries to remove the message, 
but she decides to look around the house first to find out what is happening. She looks around her room again, until suddenly, she's startled by what she thinks is some supernatural creature in the same room. She quickly leaves and calls Rebecca. Breathless, she starts talking to her friend while tearing up. Rebecca is slightly annoyed, but listens to Alice as she explains that someone else is inside her house. Alice backs up against a wall, explaining to Rebecca that the house is haunted. Rebecca hears her out, but thinks watching too many movies made her delusional. As Alice explains, Rebecca keeps accusing her that she might not be in the right state of mind. Alice gives up on convincing Rebecca, so she ends the call. Later, Alice takes her medicine and then gets back to work. Sudden motivation strikes her, believing that the story of the house and the tapes might be the perfect inspiration for her screenplay. She begins going through the recorded videotapes again. The footage starts with David filming his wife in admiration. When Lucy sees the camera, he flirts with her. Being filmed is making her shy, so David stops the recording. Lucy is planning to meet Marie, one of her closest friends whom she has not seen in a really long time. David starts feeling uncomfortable about the idea of Lucy meeting her friend alone. He does not trust her. He suspects his pregnant wife might be cheating on him with her friend. Lucy feels offended by this, but David explains that he is insecure about the possibility of her choosing someone else over him. Lucy seems to understand his side, so she walks over and reassures him that he's the only one for her. The tape makes Alice slightly uncomfortable as she sees herself in Lucy. However, the videotapes also brought the added benefit of inspiration. Alice can now finish a significant portion of her screenplay. That night, Alice struggles to sleep inside the house that has already scared her so many times. With all the strange occurrences in the house, even the creaking of doors makes her uncomfortable and keeps her awake. Fast forward to another recording of the Woods couple, David finds his wife painting a chair in their new child's room. Lucy had been working in the room alone, so she's expecting that David might help her, but he just keeps recording while she works. While watching the recording, Alice finds some comfort observing the loving couple. David places the camera down as he walks over to his wife, and things start heating up. David is interested in getting her in the mood, but Lucy grows increasingly annoyed by him bothering her, so she leaves the room. After watching the recording, Alice checks out the room Lucy had worked on. She sees the chair that Lucy painted, and then moves over to the cot made for her future child. Alice feels some strange connection to Lucy as she sits down on the rocking chair. In a soft voice, she asks Lucy what happened to her. Suddenly, a recording starts playing on Alice's laptop. Lucy is talking to someone on her phone, while David creeps up on her with his camera. Seeing her husband recording her, she cuts the call. David wants to know the person on the other end. Lucy is fed up with David's jealousy and is unwilling to give a clear answer. This causes him to get physical, feeling that he might be a danger to her. Lucy discloses that the person she was talking to is David's mother. She leaves her husband behind in the room, feeling unsafe with him around. Even with the knowledge that Lucy was talking to her mother-in-law, David still does not believe her. He decides to redial the last number, only to find that Lucy was being truthful and his mother really was the last person she was talking. He is still not satisfied as his suspicions remain. Alice watches the footage in slight horror as it brings back bad memory. However, the tapes are too engrossing for her to stop, so she continues watching even when the videos are giving her bad flashbacks. The next tape starts with David recording his wife while she sleeps. He zooms in on her face during her slumber, and eventually waking her up with a compliment. She wakes up, but looks at her husband in horror. Alice suddenly gets a call, which she picks up immediately. She's on edge as the caller does not make their identity known, and she only hears a woman crying from the other end. She cuts the call short, and then gets up from her seat, only to hear nothing but Lucy's voice in the distance. The following recording shows Lucy playing a solo piano as David records her. He is intensely focused on her, while she is more concerned with her musical performance. Meanwhile, Alice hears the same music somewhere in the house as well. She follows the sound of the instrument to the room with the piano. She sees a woman seated at the piano. However, the person before her does not respond when she enters the room, and the music continues. The performance then abruptly stops, and the woman sits silently near the piano. Suddenly, the ghost disappears and reappears in front of Alice, revealing Lucy's face as that of an evil spirit. She issues a grim warning and disappears afterward. Alice wakes up, realizing the encounter with the ghost was actually part of a dream. While the sight of the ghost may have been frightening, the dream itself is not, since Alice is not afraid of Lucy. Her curiosity continues to push her to watch the tapes, one video after another. In the next footage, Lucy is packing some of her belongings and tries to leave the house, discreetly. With David acting so obsessed, she is scared of her husband. David finds her at the door and confronts her, asking what's wrong. Lucy tries to justify herself, but David does not care. He demands that his wife return to him. He is insistent, but Lucy feels unsafe, so she doesn't surrender to her husband. Eventually, David has had enough. He forcefully tries to take Lucy's car keys away. Amid his struggle, David concludes that Lucy is cheating on him with another man. Realizing that David is losing his mind, Lucy looks at him in disbelief. His insecurities and jealousy have affected his mental health. It's clear to her that he needs psychological help. When David closes in on Lucy, the tape cuts out. Alice wants to know what happens next, so she shuffles through the tapes but finds the next tape missing. She thinks that it must have gotten lost somewhere. 
She grabs the suitcase and takes it to her room. She also puts on Lucy's clothes and accessories. She's starting to look more and more like her. Eventually, Alice sees Lucy in her reflection. With an understanding of how to evoke Lucy's spirit from beyond the grave, she starts talking to Lucy in the mirror, trying to find answers to the tape's unanswered question. Alice asks Lucy to show what happened, and this request stirs up some furniture in the house. It seems supernatural forces are now inside the mansion. Alice starts doing some chores around the house and talking to Rebecca at the same time. Rebecca starts talking about Alice and Ben's past relationship. Like Lucy, Alice had fallen victim to Ben's jealousy and insecurity. She was also pregnant and had suffered a miscarriage when Ben was physically Eventually, Alice becomes obsessed with the tapes. She keeps psychotically muttering to how she needs the tapes. After this started happening, Rebecca is once again concerned for her demented friend. Alice insists that she might find the missing tape somewhere online. Rebecca is confused, but eventually gives in and promises to search for it online during her free time. Alice waits in anticipation until her friend finally calls her. Rebecca starts describing an incident related to the Woods couple from 2006. The couple was reported missing by David's mother, but the evidence shows that David might have taken his along with Lucy's. Suddenly, the lights behind Alice start to move independently, so Alice ends the call and walks out to investigate. Nothing seems unusual, but Alice is still careful and on edge. Eventually, she reaches for one of the ceiling beams. She hangs onto it while the door closes on its own. Alice is startled for a second, but then she sees a camera containing the final tape she's looking for. With the tape now in her possession, she immediately goes to her laptop to see what happened to Lucy and David. In the recording, David has restrained his wife. He forces her to admit that she is cheating on him. She denies being unfaithful, but David brings up Luke, having found out he was out of town when Lucy was supposed to meet with Marie. David's revelation eventually forces her to break down, and finally, Lucy begins to admit her sins. Lucy admits to seducing Luke, finally giving David reason to believe that his wife had been dishonest the entire time, and the child in her belly is possibly not even his. Upon hearing her confession, David does not respond immediately, leaving Lucy alone as he fills the bathtub. David no longer seems concerned. He has lost his composure. He then frees his wife from the constraints, only to force her down into the tub. He records as he forces her under the water, trying to drown her. Lucy struggles, trying hard to break free, but David's grip on her neck is too strong. She stops struggling and loses her life in the bathtub. Alice watches in horror. The gruesome truth is not enough to cure her attachment to Lucy's story. David then pulls Lucy's body out of the bathtub, where he takes one last moment with her in his arms. He then carries the body outside, placing it in the courtyard before dragging it along to the forest surrounding the mansion. He stops after finding a suitable burial ground for his late wife. Alice keeps watching the tragedy unfold before her, not looking away despite the sheer horror of the situation. Finally, once the hole has been dug, David says goodbye to his lifeless wife. He places her body in the grave and records her in his camera one last time, before covering her up for good. With the deed done, David returns to where he prepared a noose. His completely shattered life left him with nothing to live for, so he ends with his own hands. Alice goes outside to look for Lucy. She finds the shovel and other tools David uses to bury his wife. She follows the videos to find where Lucy was buried. She eventually finds the spot, but the moment is interrupted by a phone call from Ben. He is calling to apologize and desperately wants to be forgiven. Alice listens, but then notices someone inside the mansion. She suspects it's Ben inside, but Ben denies her accusation. Eventually, he starts crying, but he finally accepts the situation and ends the call. This means there is some other intruder in the mansion. Despite the threat of an invader, Alice goes inside to finish watching the recording. Inside, she finds out that David never succumbed to the noose, having survived with his mother coming to the rescue. After discovering this truth, David appears behind her, confusing her for Lucy. Alice darts out of the chair and rushes for her suitcase. David does not react immediately. Instead, he keeps calling out his late wife's name. Alice finds her suitcase, but cannot find the one thing she packed for this situation. She calls Rebecca, asking her where her revolver is. Rebecca finally reveals that the gun was never packed because she doesn't want Alice to be left alone with a gun. Unfortunately, this means Alice no longer has her only method of self-defense. As the call continues, David shows up, grabbing Alice by the neck. Still believing it to be Lucy, he drags Alice to the bathroom and starts reenacting the tragedy from the past. This time, however, a visitor is present to help Alice. She struggles in the bathtub as David tries to drown her, but his efforts are cut short as the spirit of Lucy shows up to confront her foolish husband. David is startled by the sight of the ghost, immediately rushing for the door. He turns around again, only for Lucy to reappear in front of him and startle him again. He stumbles, falling over the ledge of the staircase. David lies lifeless on the ground as the fall from the ledge is enough to end him. Lucy looks at her pitiful husband as she completes exacting her revenge. She walks up the stairs and back to the bathroom to clear the bathtub. She unplugs the drain and stops the tap, finally allowing Alice to come out of the water. The next day, Rebecca comes to check on her friend. Given last night's incident, she's worried about Alice's well-being. All the lights are closed, and the entire mansion is in disarray. She walks around the room until she finds Alice's medicine container, alongside a screenplay printout. 
Rebecca is angry that Alice did not take her medicine, but she keeps looking for her. Rebecca enters the bathroom as she notices her friend in the tub. Considering Alice's past traumatic experience inside a bathtub, Rebecca becomes worried, so she immediately reaches in for her and pulls her out. As she tries to carry Alice over to the bed, Alice struggles and cries. She does not want to sleep because she fears the horrors awaiting her in her dream. Rebecca eventually gets her to lie on the bed. Alice is still in shock. She can barely breathe properly. So Rebecca gives Alice some medicine and listens to her explaining what she has discovered about Lucy and David. Alice reveals that David never passed away, so his mother declared her son and daughter-in-law missing to protect him. Alice then reveals that David has been watching her spend her days around the house, blaming him for all the strange occurrences. Since Alice is in horrible condition, Rebecca decides to let her friend get some sleep. Rebecca grabs the printout of the screenplay placed on the side table to see what Alice has been working on in the past few days. The screenplay reveals the events that Alice has been describing since the beginning. Rebecca tries to follow the story, eventually realizing that writing the screenplay must have been a task of great torment for Alice. She then walks over to her, apologizing for leaving the demented woman alone inside the mansion, given its history. Rebecca decides to look around the mansion to see what has happened in the past few days. She finds a camera where David was supposed to have fallen. She picks up the device and plays the recording, only to see a footage of herself. This scares her, as the recording is creepy and shows that Alice has an obsession resembling Ben's. The recording shows Rebecca, deep in her sleep, and Alice zooming in on her. Having read Alice's screenplay, Rebecca is put off by this, but the icing on the cake is when the recording ends, with Alice complimenting Rebecca in the exact same way as David complimented Lucy in her sleep. In 1992, a young girl peeked out her window and saw her terminally ill brother's toy boat floating in their backyard pool. She went to retrieve the toy boat, but an unknown force suddenly pulled her into the water. The young girl struggled underwater when she noticed a woman crouching down by the pool reaching out to her. The young girl swam up to reach for the woman's hand, but when she resurfaced, the woman was gone. She then tried to get the toy boat again, and just as she finally got it, something pulled her down. The young girl tried to scream for help, but she was underwater. After a moment, the struggling had stopped, and the young girl was nowhere in sight. In the present day, the Waller family was led inside a home. After Ray, the father, fell ill, he was forced to retire from his baseball career. The family then decided to find a new residence where they could permanently live. And here they are now house hunting. After checking the house, the Waller family didn't particularly like the house, so they decided to leave for now. Eve was driving through a neighborhood when Ray suddenly told Eve to stop the car before pointing at a for sale house. They checked it out and Ray was happy to see that there was a backyard pool because he always wanted to have one. Ray and Eve checked the pool for a while before Eve suggested getting back inside the house. But Ray saw a baseball and bent down to reach it. But he fell into the crowd and while he was under, he suddenly remembered a time when he was still playing baseball. Their son, Elliot, found his father first and screamed for help. Eve and their daughter, Izzy, followed, helping Ray out of the pool. Eve brought Ray to the hospital and the doctor suggested Ray look for a low-impact activity he can do every day like yoga or swimming, lest he get another episode again. While leaving the hospital, Ray told Eve that he wanted to buy the house with the backyard people because not only did he like it, he could also have swim therapy. Eve expressed her happiness that they are finally going to settle down in a permanent residence, unlike when Ray's baseball career was still thriving and they always had to move. The Waller family had finally decided and they moved as soon as possible to their new home. Eve had a new job and both Izzy and Elliot had also moved to another school. This time around, they don't have to worry about how little time they might spend at their new job and school. After moving back home, the Waller family then cleaned up the pool together. Izzy told her parents that a guy recruited her for the swim team and she decided to join. Ray expressed how proud he is of her while he reached down the drain to clean it. But something in the drain cut Ray's hand and he yelled as he pulled his hand out. Eve and their children got worried and approached Ray and that's when black liquid started leaking out of the drain. They called maintenance to inspect the pool and it was revealed that the pool was actually a spring pool as it was taking its water from an underground spring in the area. The pool is essentially self-sustaining, like natural filtration, geothermal heating, and all that. Later that night, Ray was unboxing their stuff while Eve was busy filling out a form. Eve went for a night swim afterward and noticed that their pet cat seemed to be acting strange. It seems to be agitated, but Eve didn't see anything that might trigger it and decided to just ignore it, assuming the cat was just unfamiliar with the new place. Eve continued swimming until she saw a man standing by the pool. She was startled but laughed it off, thinking that it was just Ray. But when she had a clear look and saw no one there, she was creeped out. Then the pool lights started flickering and Eve decided to leave the pool and go back in. She checked on her children and went back to her room where she found Ray sleeping. Feeling her presence, Ray woke up and Eve asked him if he went outside while she was in the pool, but Ray answered no. 
Meanwhile, the family cat was laying on a diving platform when the same toy boat from the start of the movie surfaced from the water, capturing the cat's attention. The pool lights started flickering again, and the next day, the cat was gone, leaving only its collar floating in the pool. The Waller family saw it and thought that the cat fell into the water and got scared. While the others looked for the cat, Ray reached down and retrieved the collar from the pool using his injured hand. He went to check the bandage and was confused when he realized that the wound wasn't there anymore and his sand was completely healed. That night, Eve woke up to a nightmare of the pool being covered up while she was underwater. She jumped awake and saw that Ray was swimming. The next day, Ray went to therapy and the doctor was shocked upon checking him. In such a short span of time, Ray dramatically improved and the couple thought that it might have been because of the water therapy which made Ray happier, realizing that the pool was helping and healing him. Since then, Ray has become a lot more chirpy and he has become more dedicated to his water therapy. One day, Elliot invited his father to go swimming with him. Ray drew a smiley face on a coin and asked Elliot to toss it in the pool for him once he was done cleaning up. So Elliot waited for his dad in the pool. He was sitting underwater when he noticed a coin being tossed into the pool. He resurfaced, thinking that his dad was already there, but saw no one. A confused Elliot put on his goggles and looked for the coin underwater. But more coins got tossed and one of them lay on top of the drain. Elliot heard a voice calling out and looked up to see a girl watching him. He resurfaced to talk to the girl but didn't see her anymore. Elliot was starting to get scared, but he just told himself that it was just Izzy trying to scare him. He continued swimming and stopped under the diving platform, where he heard a thud. An angle from underneath the water showed that someone was standing on top of the platform, but when Elliot climbed up to see, no one was there. Elliot heard a young girl's voice from the skimmer plate. The young girl introduced herself as Rebecca, and as Elliot grabbed her toy from inside the skimmer plate, a hand grabbed his arm and started pulling him. Elliot screamed in fear when he noticed a silhouette from inside the skimmer plate and went to tell his mom. Eve went to check but didn't see anyone or anything suspicious and when she told Ray about it, the latter told her that Elliot might have just been pretending because he was having a hard time finding some friends. The Waller family went to the school with Elliot to show support for his baseball training. Ray was there to help guide the students and when the team coach urged her to hit the ball just once, Ray agreed. But his sickness was getting in the way and he failed falling to the ground. He tried once more and successfully hit the ball, sending it flying so far away with the amount of strength he had managed to put into hitting it. But instead of being happy, Eve and their children were just confused and surprised. Night came, and Ray and Eve left their children alone at home for a while. Izzy warned Elliot not to rat on her and invited a schoolmate and swim teammate, Ronan, over. Ronan challenged Izzy to look for him in the pool with her eyes closed. Izzy accepted the challenge, but something pulled her down, and when she opened her eyes, she realized that she was oddly too deep into the water that she could barely see the surface of the pool. She immediately got out of the water, was utterly confused, and crept out when Ronan told her that he wasn't the one who pulled her. Ronan comforted her, reassuring her that her leg must have just caught or something and that nothing was down there. On Saturday, Elliot knocked on Izzy's door and asked her if she saw something in the pool. But Izzy denied it as she didn't want anything to happen that might compel them to move again. Elliot shared his idea that the pool might be helping and haunting them at the same time. A pool party was held and Elliot set up a camcorder to capture everything that happened in the pool. After what happened to him and the sudden improvement in his father's health, he became suspicious. It was the same for Eve who was now starting to get worried every now and then because of the pool. So Eve asked the realtor about the pool and the realtor told her about a story about the backyard pool she recently heard. The people who used to live in the house before never felt comfortable using the pool because a young girl drowned in it years ago. Eve asked if the girl's name was Rebecca and when the realtor confirmed it, something happened. Ray, who had a kid perched on his shoulders, was playing in the pool when a black liquid came out of the drain and entered his mouth. It possessed Ray and he attempted to drown the kid on his shoulder. Elliot saw it and immediately called for his mom. Fortunately, the kid's parents didn't press charges, and despite being upset, they understood that Ray must have had another episode while playing in the pool. After that event, Ray also started gasping for air and coughing out black liquid, so we've decided to let him rest for a while. The whole family was now weary because of the people. Eve did her own research about the pool and found out that there had been a long history of disappearances in the house. She tracked down Kay, Rebecca's mother, and asked her what really happened to the young girl before she supposedly drowned in the pool. Kay then told her the story of how the pool was once part of a healing spring. But the spring wanted something in return for the healing it gives people. Someone had to pay so the water could keep flowing. In order to heal a person, another must be sacrificed. It was revealed that Kay sacrificed her own daughter to save her terminally ill son. Suddenly, Kay started coughing violently. Eve saw the black liquid leaking out of Kay and into the small fountain. 
Meanwhile, Ray was taking a bath when he began choking, with black veins popping out before he stood still with his eyes dilating. Elliot heard the meow of a cat and went to the pool, which was mysteriously filled with water again. He checked the inflatable flamingo float, but he fell into the pool and the pool cover started closing on its own. Izzy ran to stop the cover from closing but was unable to stop it. With the help of Eve, who had just arrived, they prevented the pool from closing. Izzy ran to get help while Eve looked for Elliot underwater. But she couldn't find him anywhere and that's when she found a dark spot. She secured herself and swam into the dark. She found Elliot in the deepest part and attempted to pull him out of the water. But all the people who had been sacrificed to the healing spring kept on pulling them back. Eve struggled against them and broke free, but due to the darkness, she couldn't find her way out anymore. Then Rebecca appeared with Elliot's smiling coin in her hand. She let go of it and Eve realized that instead of swimming up, she had been swimming down instead. Eve finally saw the moonlight and took her son out of the water. Say pumped on Elliot's chest, trying to save him. Izzy, on the other hand, got injured when she slipped on a puddle of water and accidentally palmed the shards of glass on the floor. She then heard a strange sound and looked for her father, only to find him possessed. Ray chased Izzy down, wanting to sacrifice her to the spring, but Izzy fought back and hid. When he noticed Eve and Elliot, he went out and attacked Eve. Unbeknownst to him, Izzy was already standing behind him with a bat. She hit him, which caused him to drop to the ground, and with Eve's comforting whispers, Ray finally got back to himself. Elliot had also woken up, so the family prepared to leave as soon as possible, but Ray noticed the black liquid spreading in the pool and he knew that someone had to pay for the ghosts of the healing spring to stop haunting them. Ray made up his mind and swam towards the black liquid, sacrificing himself. Despite the tragedy that occurred, Eve and her children decided to stay in the house so that no one else could fall victim to the spring. Eve, Izzy, and Elliot also decided to get the pool filled in to prevent the spring from haunting them again.